Okay, thank you, and thank you for your patience. Uh, executive session is closed. We're now back into the public portion of the hearing, uh, and I'm going to read a, a statement. In December 2017, after receiving allegations that Councilmember Andy King violated the Council's anti-harassment and discrimination policy, this committee voted unanimous, unanimously to open a matter. After conduct conducting a preliminary inquiry, hearing from Councilmember King and deliberating, the committee found based on the preponderance of the evidence that Councilmember King violated Council policy. The committee then voted to require Councilmember King to complete ethics training with the Council's Office of the General Counsel and complete and pass sensitivity training with a trainer approved by the chair of the committee. In light of Councilmember King voluntarily agreeing to complete the required training, the committee voted to hold the matter in abeyance pending his satisfaction of the agreement. Councilmember King has completed the required ethics training and passed the specialized sensitivity training course, which included reading, a self-assessment, a full day of one-on-one -on -one specialized in-person training, and a follow-up phone call. In light of Councilmember King completing and passing the training as required by this committee, we have voted to close the matter. So with that, we are going to um, close this matter. We're going to uh, recess for a few minutes before we hear um, testimony on uh, intro 735. Thank you.
Okay, thank you everybody for your patience. Uh, we are about set to start the second portion of our hearing. Um, today we'll be holding a first hearing on intro 735 sponsored by myself in relation to the advisory opinions of the Conflicts of Interest Board. Under the City Charter, the Conflicts of Interest Board, Board or COIB, has two relevant powers, the power to issue rules and the power to issue advisory opinions. The Charter states that the rules power should be used to implement and interpret the Conflicts of Interest Law. In contrast, advisory opinions are only supposed to be issued on the request of a public servant and apply only to such pub public servant. In other words, when interpreting the Conflicts of Interest Law generally or applying interp interpretation broadly, a rule should be issued. When applying the Conflicts of Interest Law to the specific situation of one person, an advisory opinion can be issued. Yet for at least the past decade, that is not how these powers have been used. Between 1990 and 2007, COI promulgated a little over 40 rule changes. In the decade since 2007, there have only been five rule changes, at least four of which were directly required by the charter or local law. Meanwhile, COI has continued to ad issue advisory opinions with regularity. There have been 35 advisory opinions since 2007 and 250 issued overall since 1990. A review of the advisory opinions issued since 2007 has raised a number of concerns. First, at least some of these opinions sound like interpretations of the conflicts of interest law and therefore should have been codified by the COIB into a rule. For example, an advisory opinion from 2013 on gifts between city employees set forth standards by which gifts between employ employees would be evaluated, including an interpretation of the superior subordinate relationship all of which appear to be broadly applicable interpretations that belong in COIB's rules rather than just an advisory opinion. Second, despite the charter requiring that advisory opinions be issued in response to a request from a public servant, at least some of them were issued to provide guidance or because COIB anticipated questions in the future. Finally, the language used in some advisory opinions may be considered misleading as it seems to refer to early opinions as setting precedent. There are many benefits to interpreting the law through rules rather than advisory opinions. Rules require a public hearing and the acceptance of public feedback before they are finalized. Rules are also easier to read and find rather than searching an ever-growing back catalog of hundreds of advisory opinions which only grow with time. The bill being heard today, introduction number 735, would address the above concerns by requiring COIB to review their advisory opinions annually to identify those that have interpreted value and to codify those into rules. I want to thank the members of the committee for working together on these issues. I want to thank the staff who worked to put to get today's hearing together, Serena Longley, Deputy General Counsel, Brad Reed, Senior Legislative Counsel, Elizabeth Cronk, Policy Analyst, and Rob Newman, Special Counsel. Finally, I want to thank the Conflicts of Interest Board uh, for joining us today, uh, Carol Carolyn Miller and Ethan Carrier. Um, we will now administer the oath and accept testimony on this bill. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. I do. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Matteo and members of the Committee on Standards and Ethics. I am Carolyn Miller, the Executive Director of the New York City Conflicts of Interest Board, and with me is the Board's General Counsel, Ethan Carrier. We are here on behalf of COIB to offer testimony on Intro 735. The core mission of COIB is to educate public servants about their obligations under the city's conflicts of interest law in order to fulfill the vision set forth in Chapter 68 of the New York City Charter, the chapter entitled Conflicts of Interest. The preamble to Chapter 68 reminds us that, quote, public service is a public trust and that the purpose of a municipal conflicts of interest law is to, quote, promote public integrity in government and protect the integrity of government decision making. The board's Educational mission is fulfilled in part by its advisory opinions. Advisory opinions are the public documents that came, contain anonymized versions of the confidential advice given to individual public servants, sometimes one, sometimes many, in order to shed light on how the board interprets the provisions of Chapter 68. The board seeks through its advisory opinions to enable public servants through the lens of a specific set of facts and circumstances to understand how the legal requirements of the conflicts of interest law might apply to them. Advisory opinions also lay out factors that the board may consider in evaluating future requests involving similar issues. By publicly articulating the factors the board's board considers in a particular case, the board hopes to encourage public servants to reflect on their own actions and seek advice if their circumstances present new or different considerations. CUIB recognizes the council's concerns about the process by which the board reaches its conclusions in the advisory opinions. 
Motiv motivated by these concerns, the council seeks to replace section 2603C4 of the city charter with a mandate that certain advisory opinions be subject to the rulemaking process that would include, as required by the City Administrative Procedures Act, or CAPA, a public comment period. CYB welcomes additional public engagement with and public discussion about its advisory opinions, but the board disagrees that a CAPA structured rulemaking process is the best way to accomplish that goal. CYB would like to offer an altern alternative, excuse me, to the current version of Intro 735 that we hope the council will consider, which we have provided with copies of our testimony. CYB's proposal would require that the board have a period for public comment and a public hearing for every advisory opinion and that the board consider those comments before issuing a final version of the opinion. CUI believes that CIB believes that its proposal would accomplish both the council's stated goal of allowing for public comment on the board's advisory opinions and the board's goal of maintaining its capacity to utilize advisory opinions to provide guidance to all public servants on the meaning and application of the conflicts of interest law, all while preserving the board's essential independence. By way of background, the issuance of advisory opinions has been the central, if not the primary, function of the city's ethics agency since its inception. In 1959, the city council created city CYB's predecessor agency, the Board of Ethics, making New York City a leader in the United States for municipal government ethics administration. The original Board of Ethics had only one power, to issue advisory opinions. In recommending the establishment of a Board of Ethics, whose sole purpose would be to render advisory opinions, the Council's Special Committee on Ethics and Standards stated in its report, and I quote, impartial and objective opinions rendered by a Board of Ethics composed of outstanding citizens will have public value. In effect, such decisions will be comparable to those rendered by the Committees on Ethics of Professional Associations. In this way, officers and employees who wish to obtain impartial and objective advice will be able to do so. No public officer or employee need be uninformed on any ethical problem. With the passage of time, advisory opinions will furnish valuable guides in addition to being a source of reference for all persons concerned and will contribute to a proper understanding of the code. These opinions will reflect the practical operation of the code and will be of value to those who, pass, who must pass upon recommendations concerning its modification or amplification. The Board of Ethics robustly fulfilled this vision issuing 688 such opinions during its 30-year history. During the charter revision process of 1986 through 1988, the Conflicts of Interest Board was established in its existing form, with its powers expanded in a number of important ways. Most significantly, it was given the power to impose penalties for violations of the Conflicts of Interest Law. law. The Board's power to issue advisory opinions remained, with a caveat, Section 2603C4, unchanged since it was amended in 1998 to become effective in 1999, gave the conflicts, 1990, gave the conflicts, the new conflicts of interest board <coughs> until September 1990 to review those 688 board of ethics opinions and initiate rulemaking for whichever of those opinions the new conflicts of interest board determined to have interpretive value for the new conflicts of interest law. No such rulemaking took place. Instead, the new conflicts of interest board sought to quickly provide as much guidance as it could to public servants on the practical application of the statutory provisions of the revised Chapter 68. Notably, in this recodified Chapter 68, the power to issue advisory opinions remains solely and exclusively the province of the board itself. The staff of the board cannot issue advisory opinions. As City Charter Section 2602G states, neither the council nor any other officer, employee, or consultant of the board shall be authorized to issue advisory opinions. The board remains the final arbiter of the interpretation of the law it is entrusted to administer. As to intro 735, CUIB recognizes that the council's <coughs> primary goal in introducing this bill is to allow public comment on the board's advisory opinions. At the hearing of the Council Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections held on March 7, 2018, concerning, among other things, the reappointment of two current members of the Conflicts of Interest Board, the chair of this committee, Council Member Matteo, asked the nominees a series of questions about the value and functionality of incorporating a public hearing component into the board's advisory opinion process. The board has heard and reflected upon that line of inquiry by Chair Matteo and comes before the committee today with a proposal to implement that goal. CYB's proposal, in contrast to Intro 735, would allow for public comment in a way that preserves the board's independence, as envisioned by the city charter, 
and would maintain the integrity of the tool of advisory opinions as a process separate from rulemaking. We offer this alternative because we have four main concerns about how Intro 735 would negatively impact the board's independence and mm -hmm. ability to provide education and guidance to public servants. First, Intro 735 would undermine the board's essential independence. Intro 735 would require that the board initiate rulemaking for all of its advisory opinions, which the board determines to have interpretive value in construing the provisions of the charter, that is, almost all advisory opinions. All city rulemaking, by statute, requires the review and approval of both the city's law department and the mayor's office of operations. Thus, the council's bill would effectively remove the board from its independent judgment about the interpret interpretation and application of the conflicts of interest law and place that in the, to the hands of mayoral agencies. When the board seeks to codify the confidential advice provided to individual public servants, the law department and the mayor's office of operations would have the power to decline to certify, that is, to approve that rule. Second. Intro 735 would conflate two separate board powers. Chapter 68 of the city charter was carefully drafted to give the, the new board two distinct powers, rulemaking, as codified in section 2603, and the, issue of, the issuance of advisory opinions codified in section 2603C. The first responsibility, rulemaking, helps to implement the law. The second responsibility, the issuance of advisory opinions, explains the law that already exists. A public servant cannot be punished for, quote, violating an advisory opinion because it is only a document that provides guidance about what the law already requires. If a public servant is charged by the board with violating anything, it will be the charter itself or a for formally promulgated rule. Third, Intro 735 would make it harder for the board to provide effective guidance to public servants. Rules are a blunt instrument for educating people about their obligations under the conflicts of interest law. Rules are required by both the language of the Charter and the requirements of CAPA to be mandatory, uniform, and universally applicable. The Board's advisory opinions, generally speaking, are not that. Rather, its advisory opinions are guideposts for how the Board is thinking about the conflicts of interest law and the factors the Board is considering in applying this law to specific questions. Advisory opinions provide color and context for how a certain Charter provision or an existing Board rule would apply in the variety of everyday situations in which real public servants find themselves. Advisory opinions help public servants understand how to comply <coughs> with the law and alert them to when they might need to ask for their own individualized advice. Fourth, the disclaimer requirement of Intro 735 would cause city employees to miss the educational value of advisory opinions. Intro 735 would require for any citation to a previously issued advisory opinion of the board a statement that the guidance of that opinion applies only to the public servant for ask for that opinion. The primary purpose of the Conflicts of Interest Board is to help public servants understand what they need to do in order to comply with and avoid violations of the Conflicts of Interest Law. And those requirements should apply the same to every single public servant, whether or not he or she requested an advisory opinion from the board. To require this limiting statement in every future advisory opinion would create the mistaken impression for future public servants that the law applies differently to the person who asked for the guidance than it would to them. It would also undermine the goal of ensuring that the board's interpretation and application of the law, whether public or private, is uniform and universal. In conclusion, COIB supports the council's efforts to implement a mechanism to allow for public comment on the board's advisory opinions. This effort aligns with the board's core mission of increasing public servants' engagement with and understanding of the conflicts of interest law. The board's di disagreement is with the use of mandatory rulemaking as the structure for that public comment because, in the board's view, such rulemaking will ultimately undermine both the independence of the board and the board's ability to provide clear, <coughs> comprehensive guidance to the thousands of public servants who rely on its work. CIB believes its proposal for a revised section 2603C4 which provides for a public comment within the com public comment period within the advisory opinion process is a better approach. We would welcome the opportunity to work with the council to help craft legislation that effectively advances the goals that we share. Thank you. Thank you. Um, certainly went uh, covered a lot in, in, in your testimony. I appreciate that. I appreciate your willingness to want to work with us. Um, we obviously understand uh, our differences, but that's why we're here to talk. So. I'm going to bring this back a bit. 
but you did mention a lot, and I think there's um, a lot of confusion between advisory opinions and roles. So I think I'm just going to – you said a lot in your testimony, but I'm going to ask you some questions just to clarify, I think, because I think um, – you know, part of this issue is is understanding actually the, the advisory opinion, what it does, where it came from. The same thing with the rules, and then we can go over. First thing, I just want to I just want to clarify for my own. I, I think in your testimony you said something. Um, there was 688 opinions. That I just want to clarify. That's the board of ethics. That's not including the 250 that the that COIP has, right? You're exactly right. Okay. That's the that's the first iteration of the board, the board of ethics 688, and then you were correct in your um, opening statement that it's. 250 since 1992. And 35 since 2007. You think that's that, that sounds about right. Right. Okay. Okay. So, uh, serious. Uh, like I said, I'm just I'm just going to take it back. So, can you, in simplistic forms, explain the difference between advisory opinion and a rule and a rule? Uh, sure. Uh, a, a rule is a, a statement of general applicability um, that uh, that you know covers. A wide group of people about a wide group of circumstances, um, and an advisory opinion is a is a specific application of that rule to a set of facts uh, at the request of Small uh, a public servant. So, the, what's the process? What is the process of getting to an advisory opinion? Are you asked, or is this coming towards you? And the same thing towards the same question for a rule. Yeah, well, we are asked uh, for an advisory opinion. Uh, I believe that there is a, a, a mechanism by which uh, the board could be asked to uh, promulgate a rule, uh, but but um, but it can also initiate a rulemaking uh, sua sponte based on someone's question. Um, I, I I think it can initiate a rulemaking to uh, you know to uh, for any sort of part of Chapter sixty eight within its within its authority to do so here. And when we say anyone who. Specifically, uh, who, who's asking um, when when you come to an, for an advisory opinion or a rule? Just well, public servants, elected officials. For yeah, for advi for advisory opinions, it's uh, any public servant. Um. So, from what, what what we gather here is an advisory opinion is supposed to impact the person who's asking. The is that the advisory opinion by the language of the charter. You're exactly right is designed to, um, is, is for, to answer the question of the requesting public servant. But the board gives hundreds, if not thousands, of pieces of confidential advice all the time. What it chooses to make public in an advisory opinion is something that, that the board believes would be useful to other public servants to learn the advice given to the requesting okay. public. Okay, so I guess that's where, I guess my, my, my first confusion comes from. Why not make that a rule if it's going to impact more than one person? So if I'm asking you a question that says, can, can I attend an event this week? And you say, uh, no, you can't. Uh, I'd assume that that's for the rest of my, uh, my, my 50 colleagues as well, uh, if I'm asking for a, a, in my role as a council member. So would you issue an advisory opinion, or would you, would you look to make that a rule? And, and, and don't make it Friday, because maybe it's not the time, but if I asked you two months in advance about an event, no, 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 you I had enough time. Right, right. I, I appreciate why, that. Why, why would it be an advisory opinion? Because then I think the argument could be made that that would only apply to me because I asked, and my colleagues would say, well, that should only apply to Councilmember Matteo because he's the one who asks, and it's an advisory opinion. If it was going to impact all of us and tell us yes or no, we, sh we can go to that event, um, it should be a rule. Well, I, I, it's, a, it's an uh, interesting example. So the, right, what, I, I, might, I might try to draw the line a little bit different between advisory opinions and rules, which is that a rule creates a new legal obligation and an advisory opinion describes, based on a specific set of facts, a pre-existing legal obligation based on the law that already exists. So when, when a council member comes to the board and says, can I attend a specific event, the board or board staff looks to the law that already exists City Charter Section 2604B5, the board rules relating to gifts, and applies that law to your to the circumstances articulated by the council member. Um, to have a, so that's based on the fact there's no new law being created in the answer to that question. If there was a need for an additional law that was expanding um, in some ways what the requirements are, that would be the purpose of a rule. The advisory opinion is distinct from that. 
I, 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 and I understand your your answer. I just I, I guess I'm confused because it, it, the language of it is saying only one person is so is impacted by that advisory opinion. So I guess my point is, shouldn't it be that be a rule and shouldn't it go through the rulemaking process then if it's going to impact a bunch of people? Well, so so in, to take to take your example about receipt about seeking and receiving advice about attending an event. The, the board actually has promulgated uh, some rules and that are exceptions to the gift, general gift prohibition that deal with public servants attending events. Um, and uh, those are you know, 101 F and 101 G for elected officials. And, um, and uh, you know, those rules essentially, essentially focus on the question of, is there a city purpose uh, for attending that event, right? I mean, there are a variety of different ways in which the rule that's already been promulgated kind of gets at that question. But at the end of the day, there's a specific set of facts that are about what the event is, where it's being held, and so forth. And some sort of judgment has to be made. Does the rule, uh, you know, what does the rule say about that specific set of facts? The, um, the concern about um, issuing a rule every time somebody wants to go to an event is, is that you, you would end up having, you know, thousands if not tens of thousands of rules where each one was sort of governing uh, a single event um, when there is already uh, a rule that, that governs that you just have to uh, apply that rule to the specific facts of the of that public servant circumstances um, can you just tell me how one finds an advisory opinion from general public website and, and a rule yeah they're, they're on our they're, they're all on our website and the websites the the link is just conflict of interest from the NYC Gov. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's. There's and, and all of them are listed. Yes. Okay. So, um, you testified <coughs> that rules have a general application. Uh, I believe you also testified that uh, AO should not be limited to apply to a public servant who asks for that opinion. To me, it seems to be blur the line between an advisory opinion and a rule, and I think that's what I'm trying to trying to get at. Sure. Yeah. That. that it, what what's the well i think right the 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 advisor opinions are only binding on the public servant who requested the opinion uh but certainly the board wants to be consistent in the way that it it applies the law and so um it, that's i think the whole point of having advisory opinions be public documents is that they have an educational value uh public servants including public servants who are not the person who asked for this specific advice um, have the opportunity to see what the board has advised uh, a public servant about that subject and uh, how the board went about thinking about that process. That is, you know, when the board was ha lays out a set of facts and applies Chapter 68 and the, and the board rules that have been promulgated to that specific set of facts, <coughs> you can see how the board thinks about how that application works. So if you put out an advisory opinion that says, so and so can't go to this event, and they go. What's the what's the realistic repercussion then? Well, the board is going to the advisory opinion is going to be applying some section of Chapter 68 or the board rules to that circumstance. So that public servant would be uh, potentially subject to enforcement action uh, for violating Chapter so 68. And, I, and I'm not saying that your advisory opinion maybe wouldn't be correct in saying you shouldn't go to that event. I'm just saying I think that there's confusion in understanding, you know, who it applies to, even that if it's out there, mm -hmm. and that it should be a rule to go through that process of public comment and hearing uh, from the public and hearing from maybe those who, who may be impacted um, to get to the right rule. Um, I think that's, uh, for me, that's where I'm headed. Um, are you also testifying that COIB can make a new law by rule? Well, I mean, no, I mean, okay. not, not, at, not as probably you intend that. I mean, rules are technically a, a kind of law I mean, that, are, that are promulgated through the CAFA process, but they're not, you know, they're not uh, admin code or city charter. They're, they're regulations. So when you're preparing these advisory opinions, mm -hmm. can you just walk us through that process? And are you, are you seeking input from the person who asked or maybe others in the same situation? Well, 
just right every advisory opinion was at least was started out as an individual request for advice um, and oftentimes multiple public servants have asked similar questions and based on the kinds of questions the board is seeking because it's always the goal to educate people so people want we want people to have the opportunity like like your example from before about whether or not a council member can attend a particular event the more information the board puts out there about what kinds of events or city officials can attend and the requirements and things like that the the more power each individual public servant has to make to make judgments to know when to ask questions so the advisory opinion is uh, First, an individual request for advice, so there's a communication with an individual public servant about an event or whatever other conduct they're concerned about. That person gets an answer. We're always in communication with people individually. Arguably, that person could disagree with the answer and come back to the board, provide additional facts. Once there's a conclusion on what the answer is, the board decides, could other people learn from this? Would this be useful as an educational tool? And then decides to anonymize it and uh, create an advisory opinion. Has <coughs> Excuse me. Has Coib ever amended a, uh, a previous advisory based on public appearance, public uh, testimony, or or maybe that the, the person who asked talking after you've issued the advisory opinion? Like, have you ever amended an advisory opinion based on uh, continuing discussions with the person who asked, or or, or public sentiment, or? Uh, to, to I, I believe there have been three advisory opinions that have been revised. Uh, three, you said? Three, I believe. Um, Do you know why? I, I don't know about the – two of them were are, are fairly older opinions. I'm not actually sure what the what the reason for that was. Um, and then uh, one was recently – one in 2017 was recently amended in response to uh, comments the board received subsequent <coughs> to the issuance of the opinion. Okay. Uh, in the past few days, COI put out its regulatory agenda for the upcoming fiscal year. Mm. Uh, in the agenda, you state that you're considering amending your rules regarding valuable gifts and gifts from lobbyists. Uh, in light of your experience in advising and enforcing the current gift rules, can you just explain why you've chosen to do this through uh, rules rather than advisory opinion? Oh, I'm because there are a number of sort of small technical issues and things that the board has learned over the 28 years. It's, it, it's actually not any one thing. There's, there are probably a couple of dozen tiny little things that um, could be sort of tidied up. Um, you know, when those, when those, uh, those rules were issued uh, early on in the board's history, I think, and, and the board's just learned a lot in applying those rules about how they could be done a little bit better. So uh, you have concerns about the law department, right? Uh, the role of the law department in, in, in your, I believe in your testimony talked about their role. So can you explain those concerns and um, the genesis of them? Um, well, the, the board is uh, um, very, you know, always concerned about its independence. That's the way we can serve every single public servant, uh, both um, in the executive branch, the legislative branch, and mayoral and non-mayoral agencies. And we, you know, we, and the process of interacting through the rulemaking process with the law department essentially gives the final say to the law department in what uh, rule promulgation consists of. The board um, recently engaged in very uh, hefty rulemaking, for lack of a better word, in, um, as required by the council's legislation related to um, not-for-profits affiliated with elected officials and their agents. Um, so very comprehensive rules. Those were, you know, the 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 interactions with the law department made it clear that their certification process was a critical sort of un, uh, inflexible component of that. And so essentially instead of the board being the ultimate decision maker on how the law should be applied, it, it ended up being sort of a, a final say by the law department in that regard. And do you believe that the law department's role changes the substance of the final rule? Um, well, they're making legal judgments about, they're not just, you know, adding a comma, they're making legal judgments about what's appropriate. So arguably, yes, they, they make judgments about what the law can be, what the rule can be, excuse me. So you, you said, you, you just talked about some of the rules, right? So in total of uh, about 41 rules from 1990 to 07, and since 07, COIB uh, 
promulgated five rules, four of which we required to do by law, as we just spoke about. So why, why does it, the sudden stop and making more rules? Uh, it seems since 07, aside from the ones that are that are mandated. I mean, I, I guess I would I would answer that question. Is that and it's a in two ways. I think that's a, an in, a useful observation about how the conflicts of interest board, much of the rulemaking was done by the board in its infancy to sort of set up a structure, the gifts rule, the use of city resources, many of those rules can date into the 90s and, and much less thereafter, where the board is just seeking to help people understand what their legal obligations already are. We didn't, because the board views rules as adding additional legal obligations on public servants, the spirit has not been at the board to add additional legal obligations to public servants, but make sure that everyone understands what the existing legal obligations are. The, um, that being said, the board, as, as uh, the chair noted in your um, reference to our legislative agenda, we'd like to return to thinking about how rules are a component of what the board does. Um, that's a discussion that we've been having internally in advance of, of the council's proposal. Um, so we're, we're sort of thinking about the same things in that regard. We just uh, would go about it differently. Yeah, I mean, listen, for me, I, I always believe that going through the process, the, the, the public testimony, the you know, hearing things that um, <clears throat> we may not be seeing, um, you know, I'm one when we look to pass legislation you know, I'm always asking what's the unintended consequences. Sometimes it's great to hear from the people who are, will, will have the impact, will, will the rule will impact to understand if they're, uh, you know, an unintended consequences or unintended consequences for that matter. Um, so just walk me through. If, if, you're gonna, if you're going to make a rule, what, what's the public, the public comment is what? Just written? Do you do it through forums? Do you do hearings? What's notice? What's yeah, what's required by you know the, the board's same? city administrative procedure act, which uh, y you know we're required to t we have a the board's deliberation. Usually, the board's deliberations are confidential, as required by the charter. The board would meet in an open meeting to discuss the proposed rules, um, which would be on notice, so people can attend that open meeting. All the documents relate that the board would receive would be publicly available. Then we'd have a, a formal public hearing as required by CAPA once the, the process had been completed with the law, approved by the law department, approved by the mayor's office of operations. We take both written testimony and oral testimony or both as people would see fit and then, um, you know, would, would be the ultimate decision maker on that. Okay. Um, so, um, do you ever review old advisory opinions? Just, uh, uh, you know, the board itself? I mean, uh, like just go through methodically? Yeah. Reviewing? No, I mean, you know, each opinion, because it's applying to the, the circumstances of that, of that moment, um, the board ha doesn't, you know, go back. It's not intended, to, they're not intended to have precedential value. Do you have a process if you wanted to um, amend or attract an advisory? Opinion? Um, the the board has the board has the authority to do that. But so, would you would you review them aside from any legislative uh, input? Would you review them if someone asked you that to re look at an advisory opinion to focus on this, or uh, would you would you if someone re asked you to say look at the advisory opinion from two thousand nine number forty two, would would you would you review it uh, based on someone's question, or would you just look to move forward on, on an issue? Generally, the board has just looked forward. You know, what, so what it's never it? looked back on an advisory opinion to amend or, or retract? Uh, it, ha it has not. Um, do you believe there are any rules that the board currently disagrees with? Uh, any, of the, any of the rules that the, yeah. that the board has promulgated? Uh, not, not to my knowledge. I mean, you know, there are always, you know, a definition of a term would be helpful, or a little tweak here would be helpful, but not nothing nothing substantive. And uh, AOs. Uh, that I I don't know. Okay. Um. So uh, you know we, we we've talked about this a bit on, on my next question, but you know it seems supervised opinions have been issued without having been requested by a public servant as required by the charter. Uh, this includes the AO in 2013 on gifts between city employees. 
Um, that was issued to summarize the board responses and AO in 2012 on post-employment restrictions that was issued to provide guidance to public servants as well as others. Is that a correct exercise of your charter power for advisory opinions if you weren't asked? Well, the, you're pointing out two interesting um, different types of advisory opinions. The one about gifts between city employees is the result of many, many questions the board has received about gifts between city employees. We're asked um, every holiday season, we, we were asked um, by a specific public servant related to a significant life event in advance of that um, particular advisory opinion. So that advisory opinion is among the more traditional advisory opinions. The board's um, advisory, the, the other one uh, that you noted about the post-employment rules is to, to basically to explain the board's thinking because again, the board is asked regularly for um, waivers or other kinds of post-employment advice um, and again, to provide the greatest educational value so that, so that pe um, city agencies who seek and city agency council who seek to obtain waivers for former employees to communicate with their former agencies to give them the information that they need about what the process the board goes through to consider those requests for, for a waiver. So the board thinks that the educational value of that particular type of guidance is, is great because we wanna give people the tools to understand how the board works. You know, uh, I think just simplistically, when, when someone is looking at the advisory opinions, I, I, I do believe that um, they believe it carries the weight of, of a rule. And for me, those should be going through the rulemaking process. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're going, you know, we're, we're going, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. I think you understand where, where the council's coming from. Um, so I, I think it's just so important to, to understand that for me personally and the council and this committee believes that the, the advisory opinions, you know, if you just read what it says, it's supposed to impact one person, the person who's asked. And it just doesn't seem to be doing that. And then so we believe that these should be really going through the rulemaking process. And it may wound up that we get to the same the result of the advisory opinion. But um, I think we're missing out on that on that rulemaking uh, process. Um, does the conflict of interest board ever cite advisory opinions in external or internal depositions, reports, press releases, enforcement actions, or other communications as part of the termination of a possible violation? Um, the again, because the advisory opinions are educational tools, they are referenced to because the, it's a description of what the board thinks, but it's certainly never the predicate for an enforcement case because every single enforcement case is based on a violation of either the city charter or an already existing board rule. No one is prosecuted for violating an advisory opinion. So well, how come the board doesn't um, conduct an open meeting and then if there's something that's confidential go into the executive session for the issuance of an advisory opinion mm -hmm. um, that's just not the board's process the or board for anything in that matter too oh because the board the one of the basic um, foundational structures of the conflicts of interest board is confidentiality so that every single public servant is entitled to receive confidential advice from the board those discussions the board's meetings are confidential to preserve the ability uh, for everybody to mm -hmm. ask a question and not have anyone know uh, why they're asking or what they're asking about. So are you carved out of the open meetings law then? It's, it's uh, the open meetings don't apply to the confidential board proceedings. Only specific board proceedings are subject to the open meetings law. But then you can have an open meeting though, but you would have to, again, go into some sort of executive session, kind of like what we had to do today. When we, we have open meetings when we're required to by law, for example, and the, if we did rulemaking, when we do rulemaking, we have open meetings. And not, you, you're not required by law for advisory opinions? No. Okay. In, in fact, the uh, 2603C requires that the identity of the public servant who's requesting the advisory opinion be removed from, from it, your, any identifying information about that person. Okay. Um, in 2016, COIB issued an advisory opinion on legal defense funds, uh, an area where even your AO said that there was absence of specific legislation on the subject. So you interpreted the existing gift laws as applying to legal defense fund contributions. Why would you make such an interpretation through an AO, but to this date, not a rule? Um, 
I, the point there is that uh, the existing law uh, did address the question of what happens when uh, somebody is offering something of value to a public servant, um, and that is that that something is a, is a gift. Uh, and so the absence of law is an absence of law to say that it's something else. So, for example, uh, the conflicts of interest law does not treat uh, campaign donations that are regulated by the Campaign Finance Board as gifts because there's a set of law that regulates what those are that essentially says they're not gifts. They're donations to, uh, donations to a campaign regulated by the Campaign Finance Board. All the board was saying is in the absence of a, uh, of a you know, legal defense fund law that specifically says these donations are not gifts, they're something else, uh, that the, the plain language of the gift prohibition would apply. So I just guess my ongoing uh, confusion of this is, so I believe the mayor said that he didn't ask for it. So it goes back to technically under the charter, the AO doesn't apply to him because he didn't ask for it. And how then should he have acted in response to the advisory opinion? If technically he didn't, we believe it didn't apply to him because he didn't ask for it. Right. It is only going to be binding on the public servant who requested such an opinion, um, but it's certainly educational to other public servants. The, the Conflicts of Interest Board wants to be consistent about the way that it applies the existing law. So, um, you know, I think other public servants would be able to learn from that from that opinion. So did, did the public servant request that one? A public servant requested, yes. The, on the one that you spoke about, the legal defense? Yeah. Okay. But so technically then it would... It would, it would apply to that person who asked? It, it would be binding on the person who asked, yes. Okay, so let's, let's, talk, let's and, and again, I thank you. We've covered a lot of information uh, tonight, and I, I appreciate the cooperation with the question. So you, you, you talked about your, that you would like um, the council to consider going, um, your, your point of going back, right? To, to look at the advisory opinions um, and, 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 and how you think the legislation could be better. So just go, could you just explain a little bit more on yours? Uh, sure, thank you for the opportunity. We, uh, we recognize basically everything the, that you've said so far about the need and the value of having public comment. We, the, the board's proposal would create a structure within the advisory opinion process rather than requiring a separate rulemaking process. So the board's proposal would be the confidential um, issuance of advisory opinion. In it would become public within 60 days. The board would notice a hearing, would publish the advisory opinion in its original form in the city record. The board would have the hearing, accept written testimony, and accept oral testimony about the advisory opinion from whomever. And then, after that comment, the board would consider the comments that it had received, either withdraw the advisory opinion, modify it. Or or reissue it in, in a final form. Um, so I just one or two more questions. Um, there are approximately 28 ADOs on post-employment restrictions and everything from when the one-year clock starts to run to when waivers will be granted. Some of these AOs establish tests, such as the exigent, exigent circumstances test, only for the later AOs to explain the factors that make up that test. Only for still later, AOs to explain exceptions to that test or when a different test should be applied. Your advisory opinions, legally speaking, do not have precedential value, yet they are being built upon here as if they did, much as a series of court, decision, court decisions would. If a person was to find and read only one, of, one or two of the early advisory opinions in this chain, do you believe they might have a mistaken impression on what's allowable for post-employment restrictions? Well, the, the, um, the city charter is clear about what's, uh, what's required under the post-employment rules. You cannot communicate with your former agency for one year um, on behalf of, uh, in a compensated communication. So the restriction is, is clear. The, all the advisory opinions talk about is the way in which the board might think about exercising its power to waive that restriction under very particular circumstances. All those waiver documents are public documents uh, are available to the public, but the board doesn't want sort of the more, more narrow view of that individual case, wants to make sure that people understand if an agency were to seek a waiver on behalf of one of its employees, what kinds of 
um, facts would it need to show? What are the circumstances when such a waiver might be appropriate? So I, I guess I, for me, for the average person, I think it'd be easier if they just would be able to read uh, and understand you know, the post-appointment restrictions by a bright line rule instead of going through the series of them. Uh, would you agree? Uh, I mean, I think, I think that's, that's con confusing just on someone who's trying to find out what the post-appointment restrictions are. And, and I think a lot of us have, you know, we run into people who, who, who are confused. I, I, I think that the uh, advisory opinions that you're talking about are, are uh, by and large not about what the restriction is, but rather about what kinds of criteria the board has considered uh, uh, in, in granting waivers uh, to the post-employment law. And um, it's over time uh, looked at a variety of different things and in, in sort of an increasing number of them. And um, you know, I think uh, try to sort of explain what the kinds of things are that it's looked at, why it thinks those things are important. Um, but that's all for the purpose of looking at what all the uh, what all the reasons are that the board might think are appropriate reasons for granting a waiver to the post-employment restrictions. They're not, um, you know, uh, expansions of the restriction itself. So th I think the restriction is a is a fairly clear uh, law. That's I mean, it's, it's uh, pretty clear in the city charter what the restriction is. It's just these are the factors that the board has looked at in the past in trying to decide when it's appropriate to waive that restriction. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've been joined by uh, Councilmember Yeager, and I think he has a few questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your indulgence. As I'm not a member of this committee, I appreciate you allowing me to crash today. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Your testimony, and I missed the verbal part of it, but I did read it, uh, uh, indicates that your position is that 735 would undermine the board's essential independence. And I don't think that's really necessarily the case. And I don't want to reiterate things that my colleagues have indicated earlier during this hearing uh, because that would be wasteful of your time and theirs. Um, but I, I want to talk about something specific. Um, uh, you, you note that a public servant cannot be punished for violating, you put it in quotes, an advisory opinion because it is only a document that provides guidance about what the law already requires. The fact is that if you were to charge a public servant with violating a uh, provision of the charter, uh, it would be based upon your interpretation of what the charter says, and that interpretation is guided by your advisory opinion, which is not challengeable by anybody because it's not a rule. And so it's not subject to, for example, a uh, challenge to whether or not you've exceeded your authority under the enabling statute to enact such a rule because it's not a rule, so it can't be ch challenged. Let me give you a real live example. Um, you've issued an advisory opinion about a year or two ago regarding public servants' use of internet in public buildings. And uh, the advisory opinion, as I understand it, says essentially that if I have my own laptop and I'm in a public building and I utilize the government-provided internet for a non-government purpose, I would be violating the charter. Am I correct on that? Do you, are you familiar with that? Well, there's, there is a, a promulgated rule uh, that says that. Okay. Yeah. It's not, the, not a promulgated rule that says that. It's an advisory opinion that interprets the promulgated rule about I'm obviously not allowed to use Internet. But what you've indicated in your advisory opinion is that if it's a publicly accessible uh, Internet, Wi-Fi wi in a public building, and a public servant were to use that for a non-public purpose, that would be a violation of the charter. Well, uh, that advisor. So, first of all, there's a there's a, a board rule that that was promulgated that implements uh, a, a city charter section that says that no city resources uh, may be used for non-city purposes, and um, the board said. Uh, in response to a question about whether that applied to certain kinds of uh, Wi-Fi that's being operated by the city, um, that that applies to uh, Wi-Fi that's being operated by the city when it is um, uh, in a public building but not generally accessible by the public. Okay, so let me give you an example. Here in the council, we have Wi-Fi. I believe there's a there's a indication there. I engaged in this debate with uh, the learned council to the city council during new council member school, which we're inquired to attend. Um, and he told me that he's a better lawyer than I am, and I believe him. 
Um, uh, and the, the, live in the, the real uh, live example that I gave is that if I were to want to put out a press release saying that I'm a great council member and everybody should vote for me, I can't do that using that publicly accessible Wi-Fi. But if there's a member of the press here who wants to run against me and say Yeager's a bum uh, and vote for me instead, he can do it. Now, I can't put out a press release immediately after that using that Wi-Fi saying, no, that member of the press who issued that press release is a bum, don't vote for him. So there's two sets of rules, right? One is that any member of the public can come into our building, access the publicly paid for, the taxpayers pay for it, I don't pay for it, the Wi-Fi, and use, use it for what would, in your interpretation, which I believe is an error, would be in violation of the city charter. I'm using that not to beat you up about a particular advisory opinion, but I'm using that to echo what I believe the chairman has indicated during in, in his introduction of this bill, which is that the, as we know, because you know we are lawyers, we we give notice to people about uh, about the laws that we expect them to follow, and there can be no punishment without notice. And notice is contained in statutes and in the rules promulgated pursuant to those statutes. We can't ask the public, be they regular people from the public, or be they those of us regular people who got here on this side of the table to take notice of all the advisory opinions issued by an agency and say, don't violate any of these. So what the chair has indicated in his bill, which I believe is a wise bill, and I, and I do hope that it passes this council, is that we're asking the COIB to simply Take the rules that you've, th take the advisory opinions that you've issued, which you yourself require that everybody take note of and make those into rules. The reason that's important, in my estimation, is because when, uh, if you should issue a rule that exceeds your enabling uh, authority under the statute, under the charter, we have checks on that. We have the Corporation Council, we have, uh, a I believe it's MOX, I'm uh, not even sure where else it is, but it gets checked a couple of times to make sure that you're not exceeding your authority. And I don't believe uh, that you ever exceed your authority, of course, but I believe that it's important to give note to the people who have to follow the rules, what the rules are. Your website, your printed trainings, um, all the things that you put out there for us to know and, and the several hundred thousand public servants who work for the City of New York, you, you do, you, you, you have all these wonderful, I mean, I, I believe they are, they're wonderful guiding uh, documents. They, they, you have, you know, plain language documents that are very easy for people to understand. But you can't ask, um, you know, a, a guy who works at the sanitation department to take note of all the various advisory opinions. And um, I think that, you know, when, and I'm not really talking about elected officials because we're surrounded by lawyers and we have people who work for us who tell us what we should and shouldn't be doing. and. You know, if we have a question, we call you. You've given me advice already, and I've only been here for, you know, 100 and change days. Uh, our council here at the council tells us what's allowed and what's not allowed. I don't trust them, so I go to you. I'm kidding. But my point is that you, you do have the ability to promulgate these advisory opinions and to have them checked. And that's not to take away your authority. It's not to conflate two separate board powers. It's not to make it harder for the board to provide effective guidance to public servants because it's not what we're doing. You can still issue your advisory opinions and it's surely, surely not to undermine the board's essential independence. But what we're asking is give us the rules. Tell us what we can and can't do so that we can comply and that nobody, not us, because we'll be okay, but no guy whose job it is every day to go and pick up the sanitation can somehow get caught up in a violation of a rule because he doesn't realize that an advisory opinion was issued in 1997 and that was never actually converted to a real rule. And that's all we're asking you to do. And I recognize that you've come back to the council with some ideas, but I'm hopeful that you know between your wise ideas and uh, the chair's wise bill, there can be an understanding of what it is that we're trying to accomplish. We're not trying to accomplish a situation where you can't enforce. You're independent, you have the right to do that. Um, I think you're doing a fine job. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, the questions regarding the Legal Defense Fund, um, you know, whether or not that actually applies to anybody who is, didn't actually ask for the advice, uh, including possibly the mayor, um, is, is a very, very broad question that has to be answered. We haven't really answered that. Like, what happens to the next guy who wants to do this? So uh, I, I would just ask you to take that under advisement. I really do believe you will. Um, and I'm grateful that you gave me the chance to, uh, to speak with you today. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilmember Yeager. So, <clears throat> you know, I think he, Councilmember Yeager, talks about the frustration that, you know, he's right. It's not just us, and we'll, we'll get the answer. It's 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 those who don't know that advisory opinion, um, in like I said, ten years ago may not may have been. There's gonna be another advisory opinion that taught that says something different from the advisory opinion that was implemented then. So it's confusion. Um, the last question I have is when, when you talk about new technology and you talk about social media um, and, and how it's supposed to be used, shouldn't that go through a rule making process to understand the impact and, and hear from everyone um, w with, with the rules, you know, or in the case it was an advisory opinion, how it's going to impact and maybe here to make it better so we can all probably get on the same page to make a, a clarifying rule that everyone knows what you can and can't do instead of saying, well, you know, it's an advisory opinion. Who's it, who's it affecting? Who's it impacting? Uh, is it just impacting the one person who asked for it, or is that everybody? So if you, just to close with, I guess, that final question and thoughts on, on your end. Um. I guess the, the, I mean, I appreciate the concerns of the council. For us, the, the rule, it always goes back to what the rules already say. And there's a rule that talks about, you know, not using city resources for a non-city purpose. All we do all day is help people understand how that rule applies to them. That's, that's to have addition, the rules that already exist is, is a, enough regulation to help people understand what their obligations are under the conflicts of interest law. And everything else we do is trying to apply those rules to ever-changing circumstances. And that's really what the core of the board is. And to put those advisory opinions into the public, it's a tool. We certainly are not asking every city employee to read every single advisory opinion. They're, they can call us, but it's a tool. There's every single possible way we can put our understanding of the law into the universe to give people plain language guides, to give people classes. Advisory opinions are just a part of that. No, I, I appreciate the response. I hope you can appreciate our um, frustration about um, the confusion, of advisory opinions and rules, and why we think that we really need to get to a place where we're implementing rules that go through the public process that take into consideration testimony of those going to impact, uh, understand the intended and unintended consequences of an opinion that could be a rule. So um, we do look forward to work with you. I do appreciate you coming in, um, answering our questions, offering your own suggestions. We will certainly um, follow up with the discussion. I want to thank my colleagues. Thank you, Councilmember Yeager, for, for coming and for, for your thoughts and comments. And um, seeing that there's no one else, we're going to adjourn this meeting. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.